Hello, my name is Robert Baines. I'm the president of the NATO Association of Canada, a NGO dedicated to informing Canadians about the value of security and the importance of NATO. Most Canadians don't usually have to consider things to do with security in their lives. Uh, day to day, they can go about their business, worry about uh, their job, their family, those things that they care about. But it must be important for them to remember that security is at the foundation of everything. And security is also present in all of our international connections. Canada is not an island. And that is one of the reasons that we are constantly investigating the different issues that will affect us, that are global. Energy security is definitely one of them. And today, I'm really pleased with the panel we have to discuss these issues. Uh, NATO area energy security, the Southeast European flank. It's a great topic and to discuss it, uh, we've got a wonderful panel um, led by our moderator, Dr. Robert Butler. He is the Senior Research Fellow and Director of the Energy Security Program at the NATO Association of Canada. He was educated at MIT and the University of Michigan, where he got his PhD. He started out as an academic specialist in Soviet foreign policy, and now he's kind of come back home, of course, as we deal with many issues to, uh, uh, related to that original topic. Uh, but after 1991, he branched out into policy analysis and consulting as an expert in international energy diplomacy. Uh, he also dealt with security and geoeconomics, focusing on Europe and Eurasia. He's advised energy firms, governments, international institutions, and NGOs while maintaining an active profile publishing widely in leading policy reviews, academic journals, and the press. He's also a fellow at the Canadian Energy Research Institute, a uh, fellow at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, and past chairman of the board of directors of the Montreal Press Club. With that, Robert, why don't you take us away? Thank you, Robert Baines, and welcome everyone. Uh, I share Robert Baines's uh, joy at the quality of the panel we have. Uh, we'd have uh, Mariana Diacopoulou, who is a research fellow in the energy security program. She is a research analyst focusing on natural gas and geopolitics in the Caspian region and Central Asia, as well as Southeastern and Central and Eastern Europe. She's a member of the roster of experts of the Energy Community Secretariat in Vienna. And uh, we have also uh, Dr. Cyril Wittersolven, uh, who is, uh, advisor, senior advisor and founder of uh, the consulting agency Verosi. He is a veteran global energy market uh, analyst uh, and holds several advisory positions at international think tanks and Western firms. Uh, he has an illustrious uh, series of appointments at leading consultancy firms uh, and uh, consulting publications, energy publications. He has lived and worked throughout the greater Middle East and also experience in uh, Southeast Europe and the Western Balkans. Uh, we have in the last but not least, uh, Aura Sabadus, Dr. Aura Sabadus, who's senior reporter for the agency ICIS in London, uh, specializing in Eastern European and Turkish gas markets. Uh, and uh, she is a research associate of the European Center for Climate, Energy, and Resource Security. She, owned, she earned her doctorate at King's College London. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, we will begin with Mariana, who will give us five minutes presentation to orient us on the Southeastern Europe and what are the Western Balkans, which is a phrase which is not often used in North America, but it's fairly common in Europe. Uh, then uh, Cyril will zoom out for 10 minutes, uh, speaking about the broader geopolitics of the broader region. Then we will uh, super zoom in with uh, Ora Sabadis, who will discuss in detail one particular pipeline, the Trans-Balkan pipeline, which is, has an unrecognized significance, which runs through uh, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Moldova, and Ukraine. And then at the Mariana Liakopoulou will uh, bookend the session, uh, finishing with a discussion of the geopolitics of decarbonization for the region 
uh, that we are discussing today. So without, um, without further ado, and then I will, uh, then there will be a question and answer period. Uh, and we, and I will tell you how that will go uh, when we get there. So Mariana, the floor is now yours. Okay, thanks Robert. Just give me a sec. Okay, now you should be able to view my slides, right? Right, okay. So let's, uh, let's kick off. Thanks for your introduction, Robert, and a pleasure to be joining you today. Uh, so let me, let me start by saying that rules uh, governing the internal gas market of the European Union uh, gain in importance and impact once extended either to membership hopefuls or simply partner countries of the Western Balkans and of the broader region of uh, Southeast and Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, this is achieved by means of policy and funding initiatives uh, in the context of the energy community, including through the Central and Southeastern Europe Energy Connectivity Initiative as well as the Eastern Partnership Energy Panel. So having stressed that, let us first delve into uh, a series of problems faced by the markets under discussion today. Uh, these problems uh, at the same time serve as the main reasons uh, behind the broadly stated argument about these markets for gas market liberalization progress as opposed to Western Europe. And this holds true for uh, non-members uh, and member states alike. So let's see, uh, these markets have been historically over-reliant on Russian gas as shown in the, mar uh, as shown in the graph over here, uh, perhaps with the, with the exception of Romania. Romania has been working in developing its uh, upstream business since about the 1900s. And as a result of this, Russia has ended up covering relatively small volumes of Romania's domestic gas consumption since about the late 1980s through the Trans-Balkan pipeline. These markets uh, are ge generally lack uh, infrastructure interconnections to diverse gas supply sources. Moreover, they are poorly interconnected between themselves and with Western Europe, which is mostly the case for Central and Eastern Europe rather than for Southeast Europe. Uh, exceptions here are the Soviet era systems. We've got the Ukraine transit route with uh, rather interest Balkan pipelines and Belarus transit route, the Amal Europe pipeline. Overall, what can be said here is that consumption profiles, gas consumption profiles as shown in the graph are rather modest, whereas transmission system operators do not have such broad basis of infrastructure assets to operate in Southeast Europe. Whereas the further northward one looks, thinking in the context of a vertical gas supply chain, also applying to Central and Eastern Europe, the situation changes. For example, we've got markets like Ukraine that both consumes and produces natural gas, is well interconnected to other EU hubs and has been capitalizing on its vast gas storage capacity. While favorable time differentials of future curve throughout spring and summer have stimulated storage injection. And finally, uh, the markets under review today are mostly supplied by unidirectional gas lines. That would be east to west for Central and Eastern Europe and north to south for Southeast Europe and generally lack uh, access to LNG supplies. Exceptions here uh, are uh, Poland with its Polsky LNG operated terminal, uh, Lithuania with its Klaipeda floating storage and regasification unit, Greece with its Rebitus LNG terminal, uh, Turkey with two Botash operated LNG storage facilities and one privately owned floating production and storage offloading unit. And finally, there's the recent case of Bulgaria 
that although it was supposed to be supplied from the perspective of Alexandrupoli floating storage and regasification unit in northern Greece via the uh, equally prospective interconnector Greece Bulgaria, it still made its first purchases of some 140 million cubic meters of US gas uh, via the expanded Revithusa LNG terminal in Greece. So, uh, in what ways does the EU aim to improve market conditions within the discussed geographic regions? Well, under the Central and Southeastern Europe Energy Connectivity Initiative, um, the EU wants for the future gas demand growth of both Southeast and Central and Eastern Europe to be satisfied by at least three different sources of gas supply for reasons of cost efficiency. The EU aspires to advance this country's traditional uh, transit roles via a prospective pipeline and LNG uh, flows, be it from the Caspian and Central Asia regions, uh, the US, the Middle East, Norway, or elsewhere. It aims at interconnecting Southeast and Central and Eastern Europe via prospective pipeline and LNG projects, several of which already feature on its lists of projects of common interest. The EU most importantly tries to diffuse to these markets the Northwestern European market model, according to which price formation has to shift from oil indexation to gas and gas competition. And this is especially important in view of the expiry of Europe's uh, long-term gas supply contracts by uh, early to mid 2030s. And lastly, another challenge for the European Union has to do with the creation from scratch of commercial natural gas sectors in countries where such sectors uh, do not exist at all, like uh, Albania, uh, Kosovo, and Montenegro. And this is precisely why we, uh, we often speak about the need to gasify the Western Balkans, a need which is to a certain extent going to be covered by the interconnectors slash extensions of the Southern Gas Corridor, uh, like the Ionian Adriatic pipeline. And with that, that would be all for me for this uh, first part of my presentation. Thank uh, you, Mariana, for uh, a clear uh, overview of the, of the um, how things uh, are laid out. Uh, now we're really going to zoom out. Cyril Wittershoven is uh, an expert in Middle East and North. He's best known for Middle East and North Africa, although he does many other things. And I just handed to him uh, without knowing where he will range, but knowing that it will be uh, interesting and, and good stuff. Cyril, it's yours. Okay, thank you. I will take the approach that I will as Robert said, I will zoom out, but also zoom out back in time because and now I'm going to try to get my um, sheets also. I hope that you can see them. Yeah. Um, We've got it. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I'm always stating also at other uh, discussions and presentations I do is that how we act in the world, how we interact in the world, and how we connect or conflict, it's not only based on what we would call clash of civilizations or clash of cultures, but it's largely based on geography, aka the place where we are, the place where we act, and the place where we would like to act. So geography is dealing with how we are interacting in the world. And this is for sure also the case with energy and energy security, because as I sometimes say, God is good 
but when it's on energy or on natural resources, he is playing a nasty game because markets and production regions are not always the same. So sometimes we need something and that's available not in, a, in our own region, but it's available somewhere else. Now, for everyone that wants to know more about the series behind it, read the book of Robert Kaplan. It's called The Revenge of Geography. And I would read that together with A, The Clash of Civilizations, but also the other option and the remaking of the world order. Now, why am I stating this? Because we're looking at the Western Balkans and the Western Balkans have been and are still a major sorrow affair or a historical region where clashes of civilizations, religion and power projections have been. I'm using again some maps. The left top one is the Roman Empire, including the Balkans, including the Western Balkans, then still considered by most Romans to be just Roman and not even Slovenian or Croatian, aka one big emperor even has built his palace in Split which is now just Croatia. Now, the Ottomans have been doing the same. The Balkans was of interest, not because there was oil and gas then, but because it was a very strategic inroad into Central Europe. And for history geeks like me, the special forces of the Sultan were circumcised even a little bit more. Christian boys that were protectors of the Sultans, the Janitsars. And if you're in love with Egypt, um, the first real ruler of a semi-independent Egypt came from Al. Ukraine was a Christian, but also uh, converted into Islam. Now, taking that, forgetting even World War I, again started in the Balkans. The 1990s was almost a revisiting of the same issue, Sarajevo, Croatia, Serbia, etc. And still, even during uh, the NATO Warsaw Pact Cold War era, the Balkans had a special place because large parts of it were not a member of either NATO or of the Warsaw Pact. Now, that something changed in the last 10 to 15 years up there yes it did but when you look at the main players in the area that we are trying to focus on on in a bird view you can look at it as being a re-emergence of historical geopolitical power plays that have been always in place. We see the USA, well, in place since the 1900s. We see the uh, Turkey, follower of the Ottoman Empire. We see Russia. We see Arabs, aka Islamic Arabian history projections, and we see one big new player, which is China. In the end, all of them, the EU, 
and NATO in one way or the other need to interact. And what is currently in play is that in a more politically incorrect statement, the European Union and NATO is putting in place a reactive strategy and not a proactive strategy, leaving parts of the region or parts of the developments open to be handled by others. This, of course, is due to the fact that integration into the EU, integration into NATO does not come with a big bang. We all know that the European Union is not one. We all have our own views. That's where the days are. And we still need it and need to interact with the influence of former major power, Russia, which is a link to an energy security aspect. Russia is the main supplier of energy to the region, will be also for the foreseeable future. And Russia has certain political, cultural, religious links that are in play at the same time. For Russia, not taking anymore the more proactive Warsaw Pact approach. If you are a friend of me, I help you. And if you are an enemy, I will bulldoze you down. They are now taking a more proxy approach and are playing their own power plays in Serbia, Albania, Kosovo, and other places. Now, that interaction between the European Union and Russia has been officially always been on the case. Russia is a slight danger to security of energy supply in Europe. Again, Russia is the largest gas supplier in Europe and will stay the largest gas supplier in Europe, whatever the European Union has been doing. And it will and has been increasing even the last years due to the fact that internal gas production and oil production in the European area is going down. N Netherlands, what maybe people do not realize in the 1980s, we were the number two or number three gas exporter in the uh, world. We are now also gas importing and that gas comes either from Qatar, Nigeria, US, but also mainly from in the same you see in, in Eastern Europe, um, aka the Balkans, all gas infrastructure was based and built uh, linked to Russia. The same is for the Balkans, and this is still a major issue that, in my opinion, the European Union lacks a coherent strategy to deal with. We have already been speaking about this, but here you see main gas export lines are coming from the east. So energy security, energy infrastructure architecture has in the whole region an eye on the east. Um, 
it is slightly changing um, the last years because Turkey and Central Asia is um, trying to take a chunk of the energy supply to Europe also, but is also linked not only to Turkey being an energy hub for Europe, but also Turkey is trying to take slightly the same approach as Russia before, whose energy you take, whose word you also hear. So the influence up there is growing, was already there since the 1990s, but is slightly increasing. What is, because I think and I am not seeing any time issues yet. Oh, I just I just signaled you, Cyril, that uh, you've just passed 10 minutes. Uh, so okay, okay, can... then I will take 30 more uh, seconds. The fact that Turkey and Russia are extremely active in the region, looking at the changing environment around Turkey's geopolitical power projections in its near abroad, other players are trying to enter. That's uh, the UAE, Qatar, and Saudi in the investment sphere. And to, uh, to conclude, an Asian giant called China has explicitly taken uh, the Balkan route as part of its One Belt, One Road initiative, which is seen by the European Union sometimes as uh, a positive approach because there is uh, integration, economic growth, but China is never investing somewhere without additional uh, strategic growth. Okay, uh, I think I need now to go. Okay, thank you, Cyril. You uh, really uh, have uh, made me dizzy uh, zooming out two millennia uh, in the past and over three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, but bringing us back uh, to the region in a very skillful and useful manner since Aura Sabatis now is going to discuss one overlooked but very strategically significant pipeline, the <coughs> Balkan pipeline, uh, which um, you'll tell us where it starts and where it ends. Uh, Aura, it's, uh, it's a parole. Uh, is yours. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Robert, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak and to join this uh, this uh, interesting discussion. Um, I will bring up my presentation. Can I stop your presentation, Cyril? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. And this is my presentation. I hope you can see it. Um, I will be focusing on the region and I think that I would prefer to be slightly more optimistic than Cyril and Mariana about the region and its dependence on or reliance on Russian gas. And I will be talking about this region in transition, not just in transition from reliance on fossil fuels to a more cleaner uh, form of generation, but also transition from a region heavily dominated by Russia indeed, to one where we see more diversity in terms of sources of supply and in terms of routes. So I will be talking first of all about the role of gas in Southeast Europe during this decarbonization period. Um, and then I will insist a little bit on the role of natural gas because unlike Western Europe, where we already see big plans for hydrogen, for methane, for electrification, Eastern Europe is still a little bit behind. 
uh, and it will still rely on natural gas in the future uh, to replace uh, reliance on coal. Uh, I, will then, I will then give you a couple of examples about this changing picture um, in terms of new suppliers, in terms of new routes, in terms of activity that I see on a day-to-day -day basis in my job. And then I will be focusing on one particular route, which I think is absolutely vital to this region in terms of integrating it, in terms of guaranteeing security of supply, in terms of guaranteeing national security from a NATO point of view, um, and also in terms of uh, guaranteeing flexibility for price, for volumes, etc. So let's start. Um, I've included here a couple of figures based on analysis from my company, from, from our analyst. My company specializes in data, in forecasting, and in price assessments. We provide benchmarks for, for the whole gas industry. Um, and as you can see here, in 2019, coal and lignite fire, fire power plants stood at 33% of Turkey's total share of electricity mix. So it was huge. It's absolutely huge. Turkey had been increasing its coal and lignite capacity at an extraordinary rate, uh, thinking that this will guarantee security of supply. Um, Across the border into Bulgaria, Greece and Romania, they are also considered some of the most polluting countries in the EU uh, because of their reliance on coal fire generation. This year, the total share of fossil fuel in Bulgaria, uh, in Bulgaria's energy mix, so the 37%, um, and in Greece and Romania, roughly 40%. Um, this is all historical because these countries had to employ miners, so it's a social issue as well. Um, but going forward, our analysts predict that the share of fossil fuel in the overall mix of Bulgaria, Greece and Romania will drop to roughly 25% in 2030. I include here coal, lignite, gas. But much of the gas and coal fired cap and uh, sorry, much of the coal and lignite fired capacity will be mothballed, particularly in countries like Greece, which uh, we hear it's 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 promised to phase out coal completely, um, but also in Bulgaria and, and Romania. And according to our estimates, a very, let's say, a very skeptical, skeptical estimates, we predict about 6.5 gigawatts of new gas-fired capacity in Bulgaria, Greece and Romania. So based on these predictions, we think that at least five, 5 billion cubic meters of gas will be needed regionally. And I'll include here the, the gas that is needed for electricity generation. I don't include electric um, gasification of the uh, of, of household, of industrial consumption. I haven't included anything in terms of hydrogen production, blue hydrogen production. So purely electricity generation. Um, so clearly gas will definitely play a very important role going forward and um, most of you will probably remember when you think about Southeast Europe and about Eastern Europe, you will probably remember the gas wars, the Russian Ukrainian gas wars of 2006, 2009, when Russian gas supplies to Europe um, were cut, were, were disrupted, and millions of consumers shivered in their homes during these winters. So, as recently as 2014, the European Union produced a stress test, and um, these stress tests revealed that countries in this region, Southeast Europe were the most vulnerable countries because of this reliance on Russian gas. Now, fast forward to 2020, and this is what we have. You can see here a multitude of projects that are being developed or that have been developed already. I'm talking here about expansion of existing LNG terminals. I'm the two terminals in, in Turkey, Aliara and Marmara. I'm talking here the expansion of the Revitusa terminal in Greece. I'm talking about two new floating storage and regasification terminals for, for a liquefied natural gas in Turkey, uh, which have already been brought in. And there are talks of another one being brought in as next year. Same for Greece and another uh, um, offshore terminal being built in northern Greece. I'm talking about interconnection points uh, and three new corridor, three corridors. So two of them have been recently built. So I'm talking Turk Stream corridor, which links Russia to Turkey via the Black Sea region. The, tra trans the southern gas corridor, which as we speak, literally as we speak, is being ramped up and gas from the Caspian region will be flown to southern Europe. 
and I'm talking, of course, about the trans balkan pipeline, which has connected historically Russia to Eastern, to Southern Europe, to Bulgaria, Greece, Turkey, North Macedonia, um, via Moldova, Romania, and Bulgaria. So it's a huge pipeline with a big capacity of 30 billion cubic meters that has historically linked this region. So let's see what has been happening in recent years in terms of supplies of Russian gas to the region. As you can see here, um, a lot of the gas that was supplied to this region came from Russia. In fact, most of it, countries like Bulgaria, depended almost 100% on Russian gas. But as you can see, since 2017, the gas, the, the flows, the exports have been decreasing quite phenomenally at a phenomenal pace. In 2019, only about 10 billion cubic meters of gas were imported to the region. And this year, the gas were the, the gas through the trans balkan pipeline was completely disconnected uh, and diverted to the newly built Turk Stream pipeline. Um, and instead, the gas has been um, shipped from Turkey via Turk Stream to to southern uh, to southern Europe. But even though this new pipeline that was touted as a as a major uh, achievement for the region has seen only five uh, seen an un, uh, underutilization. So. The pipeline has a 15.75 billion cubic meter capacity and only 5 billion cubic meters have been uh, shipped in the, in, in the first 11 months of the year, so up until now. However, we see a lot of LNG coming to the region. And what's interesting is not only the fact that the US has built a, 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 a lot of market share in countries like Greece. As you can see here, uh, the United States was the United States were the main suppliers of LNG to the region, but also lots of other uh, other suppliers. Um, I didn't I couldn't include them here because I didn't want to clog up the graphs. But we we've seen suppliers from Equatorial Guinea, from Trinidad and Tobago. We've even seen the first Gazprom shipment from Mozambique came to Turkey. So it's a very interesting picture that is currently ongoing in this region, and it's very encouraging. There is a lot of diversity coming in, in this region. And in order for this gas to reach out to the four corners of Eastern Europe, um, there is only one pipeline that can satisfy that, and that's the trans balkan pipeline. And I will talk to you about it in, in just a second. Before, uh, before then, I would, like, I would just like to mention the effect of LNG prices on this region. As you can see in this graph, LNG prices have been almost half the price of oil index price, Russian price to the region. So in Q1, Q2, and Q3, so the three quarters of the year, these prices were, were very, very cheap compared to the price of oil indexed gas. Um, and I'm not talking just Russia, I'm talking Iran, I'm talking Azerbaijan, I'm talking even the long-term LNG contract that Turkey has with, or Greece has with Nigeria, and uh, sorry, with Algeria and Nigeria for Turkey. It's true that this year, that in the final quarter of the year, the Russian price will decrease because of the lag between the oil price and the gas price. But still, overall, the price of LNG for this year has been phenomenally cheap compared to oil in next price. That has forced Russia to change its behavior. And last week, we've seen Russia auctioning gas for the first time ever for Turkey. So gas has been so will be sold from next month on a spot basis, so on a flexible basis, at the price, at an auction price rather than an oil index price. So it's a very interesting thing that is happening. And very quickly, as I said, I will I will mention the Trans-Balkan line and the, the tremendous role that the Trans-Balkan pipeline plays to this region. This pipeline is now empty because all the gas that has been sent from Russia to the region has now been diverted to the Turk stream. But the pipeline has a capacity of almost 30 billion cubic meters, almost as much as Turk stream put together. Turk stream is 31.5. Um, it connects all these countries that you can see along the route. Um, and it's it, it's already been up, upgraded to allow bi-directional flow. So it means that the gas doesn't flow just from north to the south, but also from the south to north. And we've already seen shipments of LNG imported into Greece and brought into Ukraine. So this is an, in, an extraordinary development, very interesting. I've, 
I myself was incredibly excited when I first saw this because it's it's an immense change. It's a revolution for the region. So I'm very happy. And and um, the only thing that is holding back the integration and and the connection of this region are individual transmission system operators like Transgas in Romania or Bulga Transgas in Bulgaria and even Botash in Turkey because they haven't seen the big picture yet and they don't understand that in order to integrate and in order to allow all this gas to circulate to be shipped from one part to the other of this region as well as Black Sea gas which will come in the future in Romania in Turkey in order to allow this gas to cut to, to to be shipped they need to sign interconnection agreements but because of political reasons because of small selfish interests uh, they are not allowing this to happen so this is a call to everyone who's listening out there to to, to understand that this is a very important very important pipeline for the region and it could really uh, change it i've summed up here what i've seen what i've just said now but i'm happy to answer your questions and to give you more details if you're interested so thank you very much for this robert well thank you Ara, for a detailed and, and comprehensive overview of things uh, in that particular region, focusing on this uh, pipeline that deserves more attention than it's got outside the region. Now, as I promised, uh, Mariana uh, will uh, finish uh, her talk now, which, which was split in two, uh, with the considerations of the uh, geopolitics of the uh, decarbonization for the region, uh, which uh, Aura alluded to, but now focusing on the uh, decarbonization itself. Mariana. Thanks, Robert. Let me just resume sharing my screen with you. No. We have it. Okay, great. So this is part two of my talk. Thanks a lot. And uh, well, uh, let me let me conclude this part of today's webinar, as Robert said, by speaking a little bit about the uh, the decarbonization of the European Union natural gas sector. So on the road towards the envisioned carbon neutral EU economy of the 2050s, as set out in the European uh, Green Deal, gas market integration is going to develop in parallel with regulation for a future based on both electrons and clean molecules. So if gas is to justify its existence in this context, uh, the EU will have to abide by a cross-sectoral market and system approach, linking both gas and electricity transmission infrastructure. And this is what sector coupling basically means. So according to this rationale, according to this idea, existing and under construction gas infrastructure which is uh, plenty, as we saw in Or's presentation, very interesting, very insightful presentation. So this is going to serve to safely transport and store unabated gas. Well, after 2030, it is going to be repurposed to transport biomethane and hydrogen mixtures over long distances by means of interconnectors as well as to manage the intermittent and variable uh, nature of renewable energy, satisfying demand by means of uh, storage facilities. Now, let's fit the region under review today into this EU gas decarbonization agenda. Well, we all know that the EU has to act as a norm and standard setter uh, when it comes to energy transition, while also taking into account the asynchronous integration within its own energy market, as well as uh, within the markets of its partner countries, uh, 
as as energy energy can be a policy field where integration cannot be uniformly achieved across all member states and in our case here today across all membership hopefuls or partner countries alike due to diverging national interests so the discussed region, having said that, the discussed region first needs to complete its conventional gas market integration, aiming for liquidity, competition, and price integration, even if decarbonization is to slightly alter, is to marginally alter broader market conditions. For example, since the EU has to ensure access for green gases into existing gas infrastructure, Geographically, even application of principles like unbundling or third party access and overall enhancement of competition is especially important in the isolated in terms of infrastructures that are still prospective and not completed and poorly liberalized region of Southeast Europe. Uh, in this case, uh, European gas market regulation is going to ensure a level playing field for all those market actors that are going to be active in the decarbonizing EU gas market. Now, of course, uh, the region has so far profited from its compliance with the EU gas market rules. Ongoing supply diversification, for me, it is ongoing. It hasn't achieved yet. The region is on the road to achieving its full gas supply diversification. So ongoing gas supply diversification uh, uh, moreover, helped by a boost in LNG uh, supplies has made the dominant gas supplier to the region, Russia's Gazprom, re reconsider its traditional market strategies. For, for instance, uh, we have seen spot indexation of many of Gazprom's long-term contracts. We have seen Gazprom exporting LNG. We have seen Gazprom carrying out gas auctions and direct sales on its electronic sales platform for delivery to virtual trading points and interconnection points uh, to Central and Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And of course, we have seen uh, Gazprom being forced to abstain from uh, contract destination clauses following litigation initiated by the European Commission. Now, it also has to be, uh, it has to be stressed that gas decarbonization should not uh, should not end up fragmenting uh, individual markets in the region as their uh, readaptation might be time consuming. Indicatively, uh, the European Commission's hydrogen strategy released this summer states that free cross border flow and trade of hydrogen is an important cornerstone and that the risk of uncoordinated action could lead to market fragmentation as, as blending will likely change the quality of gas that we consume in Europe. Other uh, significant policy developments in the gas decarbonization front include the revision of the goals of the Central and Southeastern Europe Energy Connectivity Initiative that now aside from market integration and security of supply also speak about uh, a green post COVID-19 recovery. Indicatively, following the seventh uh, ministerial video conference, it was mentioned that challenges and opportunities related to the decarbonization of the gas sector will be from now on addressed jointly with the International Energy Agency and the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking. Moreover, the EU uh, hydrogen strategy, the hydrogen strategy released by the European Commission explicitly refers to the energy community contracting parties, while the Secretariat has encouraged contracting parties to take methane emissions into account when it comes to business operations of their national gas industries. And last, by no means least, the most important uh, geopolitical implication out of this situation for the broader region is that aside from the EU's own potential for domestic production of green gases, uh, traditional oil and gas third country transit partners like Belarus and Ukraine now have the chance to turn themselves into biomethane and hydrogen exporters to the EU should they avail themselves of their production potential. And this alone is enough to uh, critically reshape Europe's geopolitical energy map as we know it today. Uh, thanks to their existing pipeline connections to the EU, both Ukraine and Belarus uh, are estimated 
to be able to contribute some 20 billion cubic meters per year of biomethane to the intra-EU output, while Ukraine, who is now actively exploring its green hydrogen production options based on its nuclear sector experience, has been identified by the European Commission as one of its potential uh, partners with respect to hydrogen trade. And with that, uh, I think I'm done, Robert. So I will stop sharing my screen and I Thank think you. Thank you, Mariana. Before uh, the uh, questions begin, uh, there's always a custom of offering the panelists the opportunity to respond to each other or to ask each other questions. Um, the field is yours. If uh, you have none, then I will uh, take the privilege of the moderator to pose some questions. But uh, you uh, have the first opportunity before I do to comment or ask questions to each other. Can I ask Cyril a question, if I may, Robert, please? Please go ahead. Um, Robert was, uh, sorry, Cyril was talking about Turkey project projecting its power through a, a hub. Does Cyril think that this hub will be a commercial hub or a political hub? Does he think that there is room for commercial thinking in Turkey rather than just political thinking and power projection? Um, there is always room. Yeah, always. Um, looking at, let's say, the last two, three years of Turkey's acting, I think the room has been slightly closed. Any any um, interaction that Ankara is doing at present with whoever they are shocking or whoever they are dealing with is related to a power projection that somebody has in Ankara. And that includes the energy hub. The energy hub idea was set up for 10, 15 years ago, which was a very smart move. But um, looking at how they are interacting and how they are dealing with the possible suppliers, I think you need to keep into your mind that there is some geopolitical thinking, some neo realism and energy. Um, if commercials were still 100% there, East Met offshore gas would be going to Ankara and not into some subsea deep water East Met pipeline who nobody believes in except the EU. Yeah. Um, can I ask a question to Mariana? Mariana, would you like to have a question? Yeah. Um, looking at all all the plans of the EU, um, also stated in the. Green Deal and hydrogen strategy, etc. Uh, my biggest question at the present is looking at COVID 19 economical crisis, quantitative easing, financial subsidies for all. Who is going to be able, when all of these financial instruments are over? Who is going to be able to pay for the needed energy transition in a region that is already not um, financially extremely strong to 
count on the Ukraine and then being an energy, bio, gas, green gas, hydrogen exporter at present is questionable. And the Balkans and Greece, well, their economy is not yet strong enough even to bring old industries again in life. So how is this going forward, looking at the financial situation in the area, while at the same time, the EU, the EBRD and the EIB says, we are not going to support financially any gas related or hydrocarbon related projects anymore yeah uh thanks for your thanks for your question cyril uh well first of all uh in what concerns uh gas projects i mean unabated gas projects i think that uh, whatever is on the PCI lists so far, whatever is going to be on the upcoming fifth PCI list and whatever is going to be on the uh, upcoming PCI lists after that in terms of purely hydrocarbon related projects is going to be pretty much all that the European Union is going to need for security of supply and market integration reasons by 2030 by which time it aspires to have a minus plus 400 uh, billion cubic meter per year natural gas market. Uh, so if you ask me about uh, natural gas projects, as I said before, I think that the region is, uh, I wouldn't consider the region to be well supplied at this point, but I would say, and on that I would agree with Aura, that the region is well on the road to being well supplied and to diversifying it supplies with, uh, via different projects and not only the Southern Gas Corridor, but also the projects to the north of the Southern Gas Corridor, that the Southern Gas Corridor as an idea stimulated their construction. And then the further northwards we look, we have the BRUA pipeline, who of course now faces uh, a major resource base issue with the barriers posed by the national legislation in Romania, but Romania's offshore upstream business. And then further northwards, we've got LNG terminals in operation already in Poland and Lithuania. We've got projects like uh, uh, the Baltic pipe, the, the prospective Baltic pipe uh, connecting the region fields to the Polish market. We've got uh, projects uh, enhancing interconnection between markets in the region like the Baltic connector linking Estonia and Finland. We've got uh, other such prospective projects because the Baltic connector is commissioned like the uh, interconnector Poland-Lithuania or the expansion of the interconnector uh, Ukraine-Poland. So overall, uh, I consider the region to be on the road to its uh, diversification uh, of supplies. Uh, now, that's uh, one thing. And second thing that you asked me about the um, uh, funding mechanisms uh, regarding uh, green gas projects. So green gas projects, just like normal unabated gas projects, are going to be uh, included in 10-year network development plans by the transmission system operators, by the ENSOs, and they're going to feature uh, hopefully on PCI lists at a certain point. But of course, this we're going to see uh, more clearly following the revision of the Trans-European Energy Networks uh, regulation coming up uh, next month in uh, December, if I'm not mistaken. Now, the problem here is that the more we decarbonize and the higher the penetration of hydrogen and other green gas gases in our system, the problem with uh, prospective projects is their cross-border impact. In order for a project to be qualified as a project of common interest that will, uh, that will be entitled to EU funded later on, uh, later on from the Connecting Europe Facility Fund, the project needs to have a certain cross-border impact for security of supply and market integration reasons. Now, uh, when it comes to green gases, projects are clearly smaller scale. So uh, here I'm putting a question mark, whether these projects are going to be uh, entitled 
to their um, selection as PCIs or whether a broader optimization of the EU toolkit is going to need in order for these projects to receive EU funding at a certain point, because they are going to receive EU funding, especially towards 2030, because the idea is to uh, complete whatever gas infrastructure is to be completed now and up to 2030, and then move on with uh, such projects, projects related to carbon capture and storage, projects related to electrolysis, uh, projects related to storage, anaerobic di digestion, and so on and so forth. I, I hope this Thank answers you. the question, uh, but if you have a follow-up, yeah, yeah. of course, okay. I'd be glad to answer. It, Cyril, it sounds pretty comprehensive to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, uh, I don't know if you have any other uh, questions, but let's for each other, but you can make those. Yes, yes. In the... Oh, oh. Yes. Yeah. For Ora, <clears throat> um, you, you mentioned in your presentation that um, in 2020, LNG was extremely cheap. <laughs> which is um, the case. Um, however, there are already signs in the market that around 2022, 2023, allergy prices will go up. That uh, could be even, even a slight shortage in the market due to that uh, huge allergy projects are being delayed, FIDs are being put on hold, and U.S. shale LNG, American peace gas, uh, a former president was calling it, um, will not be reaching the same volumes as it was before. Oh, so we are now looking as if LNG is going to be one of the main pressure points on Russia, which is the case, taking out of the connotation that Gazprom is heavily investing in LNG. So either they provide it by a via pipeline or a via ship or via shark stream, for me, it's Russian. Yeah, it's, it's originally, it's Russian gas. Looking at the whole situation of oil and gas sector, we are heading towards a supply crunch where supply is going to be less in the next years than we had in 1990. And the figures of 2020 are black swan figures, will most probably in the next 10 to 15 years not happen anymore. Demand was down also in gas. So supply was down, prices went down. Do you think, looking at ISIS, yeah, um, do you think that that will be not the case? And will you think that gas supply from non-Russia, non-Central Asia will be at the same level to Europe as we see right now, because the main reason it's coming to Europe is because there was not one single <laughs> client anymore that wanted to have it. Otherwise, they would have gone to, to China, Japan, India, Saudi even. Yeah. 
Your question is very uh, pertinent, sir. Your your points are very pertinent, sir, and uh, I appreciate you. you I'm, I'm grateful you you raise these issues. Of course, price of LNG will go up, and as with anything, with oil, with gas, with any cycles of up and ups and downs, yeah. and clearly because of the glut, there have been there has been a pause in in FIDs, uh, but also we we need to look at demand and COVID has led to a lot of demand destruction. Yeah. Also need to remember the Asian state, the Asian countries, and the level of switchback in terms of nuclear generation in the likes of Japan, Korea, yeah. um, and so forth. And also going forward, the relationship between the US and China, because that will determine to a large extent the level of LNG deliveries into China and ultimately into Europe. Um, the one thing, probably there won't be, LNG prices won't be as cheap as they have been this year. That's that's sure. And I completely grant you that. We may not see as much LNG coming to the region. Again, I grant you that. But what LNG has done, and that's the genius of it, is that it has caused a lot of disruption. And the fact that American contracts, particularly the Chenier contracts, include re removed the destination clause, which meant that companies couldn't resell, um, that companies can resell the gas, has led to a lot of transformations. And it has forced traditional suppliers, traditional producers like Gazprom to adapt to the new conditions. It has created flexibility. So even if the price of gas goes, that the cheap price of gas goes, even if there won't be as many supplies to the region, there will be more flexibility. At least that's my personal conviction. And there will, Gazprom, just the fact that last week Gazprom started auctions to the region and the fact that lots of companies are asking for flexibility, they don't want six BCM of gas is up for renewal in Turkish contracts next year. Right, I'll be very curious to see if Gazprom will be renewing for 20 years at the punishing oil index price. I'll be very curious to see that. But again, you know, it's it's. I think I think the whole the whole industry is, is changing and it's clearly affecting the Eastern Eastern European market. Thank you, Aura. Is are there any further discussions? Yes, Cyril. Um. Right. Um, your presentation was largely on the eastern side. When we look at Western Balkans, um, I, I'm even that I'm less optimistic than you for the eastern side. Yeah. Um, when I look at the Western Balkans, I think that LNG would be there the main option, but then not as we are seeing it right now, because Greece and Turkey and Bulgaria, etc., they all take the FSRU approach. When I look at the Commercials, I've never understood the FSRU approach at all, including for Turkey. Do you think there would be a commercially attractive, feasible approach to put in looking at a thousand Greek islands? Um, <laughs> 250 Croatians, Slovenian cities on the coast, industry on the coast, that small scale LNG would be a much more commercial, feasible approach. Uh, well, I remember from my discussions with uh, Greek policymakers, they, they were very interested in, in CNG, that's for sure, but that was 10 years ago. So I don't know what their view has, is, is right now. Uh, 
I mean, clearly, gas well does offer base loads um, backup. So, so it's it's an mm. fuel, and there is a need for putting all these islands that you mentioned, the Greek islands, on gas. Um, we've seen countries like Greece and Croatia advancing on their LNG projects, on the FSIU projects. I mean, mm. Bulgaria yeah. has taken a stake in FSIU. Uh, Croatia is now ramping up. Um, and collaterally, we've also seen countries like North Macedonia interested in taking stakes in these projects. I mean, I've spoken to people in North Macedonia and they told me that they're interested, like Bulgaria, uh, to take a stake in, in the uh, Alexandropolis terminal, or at least to ensure that they bring more gas uh, to the country. I don't, I can't tell about other countries, other countries of the Balkans, maybe Mariana would be more better suited to, to explain what's happening over there. It's not really my area of, of um, expertise. But what I do see is that these countries are interested in diversifying away. And the fact that Bulgaria has taken cargoes last year, that North Macedonia is now expressing an interest, that Croatia is now looking to bring LNG and, and will be putting in place, and that there are all these interconnectors that link up to Ukraine. So Croatia, Hungary, Hungary, Ukraine. You know, this indicates that there is diversity coming to the region and it's happening it's happening in small in, in small projects uh, you know it's happening at a small scale it's not something gargantuan nothing of the size of the southern gas corridor or turk stream but it's happening and it's encouraging as far as i'm concerned this is encouraging okay well mariana uh aura uh, pointed toward you uh, toward the end of her answer. You're not obliged to intervene, but if you have a comment, uh, <laughs> you uh, have the opportunity. No, just just a word on the on the Western Balkans in particular. Uh, Europeanization and gasification of uh, energy consumption profiles of countries like um, Albania, uh, Kosovo, uh, Montenegro, uh, Croatia. They were, um, as, 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 as ideas, Europeanization and gasification, they were initiated, they were kick-started by the Southern Gas Corridor. And that was one of the reasons why the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline was selected back in 2013 by the Shaft Denise Consortium as uh, the Southern Gas Corridor's European segment versus the much larger scale uh, Nabucco West project. So, uh, what is the what is the plan here is to create a northward expansion of the Trans Adriatic Pipeline called the Ionian Adriatic Pipeline uh, from uh, Albania uh, all the way to uh, further northward, and then there is going to be the LNG option starting from Croatia from the Croatian island of Kirk that is basically going to give further supply options to the off-takers of the Ionian Adriatic pipeline. And it's going to enable the, the, uh, the north-south flow feature of the Ionian Adriatic pipeline. So I, I don't have in mind um, specific uh, intentions of the countries uh, in the region uh, to, uh, to, to receive LNG or to be, um, uh, to be gasified from Kirk LNG in particular from the Ionian Adriatic pipeline, especially the Ionian Adriatic pipeline is an, is an unrealized project. I mean, with Kirk we're close, Ionian Adriatic pipeline is not in existence yet. <laughs> uh, but I think that it was the Southern gas corridor that basically gave the impetus for the, um, the rationale behind such projects in the region of the Western Balkans. Thank you very much, all of you. Very dynamic, intensive discussion. Uh, Robert Baines, how do you judge proper to proceed? I may possibly, uh, if you direct me to, uh, avail myself over the privilege of the moderator to put questions to the various <coughs> panelists, or it's possible that there are questions already arrived from the audience. It is uh, up to you to 
direct how we proceed. Sure thing, Robert, thanks so much. Um, I'll just ask one question, um, hand it over to Griffin for, for one or two. We do have limited time, about 15 minutes. And then Robert, depending on how much time is left, perhaps you can uh, ask the more pertinent questions if uh, that sounds good. So um, for the panel, uh, I'm not sure how much you're aware of, of NATO's um, discussions over the pandemic, but since March, NATO has been talking, as you might assume, uh, quite a bit more about resilience and energy security is very high on that list, not surprisingly. And uh, I'd just like to, to get a, a sense, uh, I don't expect a, a anything hugely nuanced, but just a, a general sense. You're all experts in energy security and Robert, if you wanna uh, hop in, you're welcome to. But I'm just curious on the general sense uh, of awareness of the, the value of the infrastructure security the, um, the importance of diversification for maintaining energy security for individual countries, not only NATO countries, of course, but members of the European Union as well. Uh, all of you, uh, I mean, started out discussing about the, uh, the cold winters from 20, uh, 2006 to 2009. So this is not a new concept, but I'd just like to gauge how much has this now suddenly leapt to, uh, to another level because of um, the, the current pandemic we're in. And that's for whoever would like to reply. Does anyone want to jump in, uh, failing which I will designate a responder? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, if, if it's okay. Um, as, as, I, as I showed in my presentation, Robert, um, I genuinely think that the Trans-Balkan pipeline is the answer to NATO security questions. Uh, not just because it's a pipeline that links all these countries. In fact, we see four countries, four NATO countries along this pipeline, Greece, um, Bulgaria, Romania, Turkey, and of course, a NATO ally, which is Ukraine. Uh, but also because this pipeline runs parallel to the Black Sea, where we've just mentioned, where I just mentioned, the Black Sea gas supplies. So Romania has sits on, on pretty impressive uh, gas supplies. Turkey has found huge gas supplies this summer, over 300 billion cubic meters, close to 400, I think they updated recently. Romania is about 80 billion cubic meters. So we're talking almost half a trillion cubic meters, which is huge. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the figure in cubic feet. I know that North Africa, North America is a keener on feet, but it's a huge, it's a huge volume of gas. Ukraine as well sits on a lot of gas. Now, all this gas could be easily transported through the Trans-Balkan pipeline. Maybe there is a need for a, a a, a small upgrade so that the pipeline is connected directly to the offshore fields. But this is just minor investment in, in a very short period of time. But it all depends on the willingness of the local operators to open up this pipeline, to sign interconnection agreements immediately. So Romania with Ukraine, Romania with Bulgaria, Bulgaria with Turkey, Turkey with Greece and so forth. So all act in concert and ensure that this pipeline either has access to the Black Sea gas or to LNG coming in or indeed to the Southern Gas Corridor. Uh, it's a fantastic alternative to Turkstream. I mean, imagine, imagine there was a naval conflict in the Black Sea and, you know, Turkstream was disabled. What would happen to these countries? Turkstream uh, supplies gas to the Istanbul region, which has 20 million people. So if that gas is cut, what will happen? I mean, luckily, Turkey now has LNG supplies and it has increased its storage capacity. It's done a great job in recent years, for sure. Not in terms of um, setting up a market, but in terms of expanding its infrastructure. So there is there is this pipeline that, that could help going forward, but hopefully someone hears us and uh, <laughs> will take action after this uh, this wonderful seminar, a webinar. Perfect. Other comments? Go ahead, Cyril. Yes, um, I'm, I'm, maybe it's, it's my age, but um, uh, sometimes I hear energy security and then we are talking about a pipeline. A pipeline in 
the principle is in security aspects. It's a very simple operating uh, issue which can be dealt with security wise. If you want to, it's extremely easy to block. Um, and then I'm not even talking about cyber security because the whole region the whole region is not really yet at a level that I would say um, it's it's able to block whichever cyber security attack on critical infrastructure would be put in place. And Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, Iran is extremely close, all well known to be very active in certain say the black operations um, where strangely uh, nobody but the, the, that was in my presentation which i could not end um, if we look at the fact that we are talking about gas okay we we have diversified gas supply we have diversified gas infrastructure transportation infrastructure but if you look at who owns the electricity plants or who is investing in critical infrastructure in the region and i'm talking to nato on it yeah um i think if you have hairs in your neck they are standing up because the main investor in the Balkans is Beijing. So we are looking at one aspect of energy security or security of energy and we are not looking at who is owning or investing or owns the debt which is the Chinese way of projecting power without Chinese soldiers, um, who owns the infrastructure that is going to use the gas to provide electricity and heat. It's, it's China, who is heavily investing in the whole region, in the critical infrastructure where efforts are used, or ships, or oil tankers, gas tankers, etc need to land it's china who has taken the whole approach of obor as an instrument of the silk road projection is china and nobody is addressing the fact that if i want to bring istanbul down i'm not Looking at the pipeline, I will sink one ship in the strait. And there is no ship that can bring anything anymore. Uh, yeah, so, so, or I will ask, um, okay, a specialist or a hacker somewhere in the middle of Mongolia and target the critical infrastructure of Serbia, of, of the Ukraine, which is happening every single day. NATO, NATO COE in Ankara, uh -huh. uh, NATO COE in uh, the Baltics are looking at cyber security attacks on critical infrastructure, critical energy infrastructure. The Ukraine is a main example. And my other half here in the house is dealing with cyber security for major oil and gas companies. I would be worried because the Ukraine and Serbia, Croatia, Greece, etc., is definitely not yet at the level of a shell or a 
across from, yeah, it, it, it's easy. Can I just say something? So, so you don't have to invest directly in the region to bring down the infrastructure of this of these countries. So oh, no, I know that. can bring can bring down the mighty TTF just yeah. sit, uh, uh, the, the, hey, in, in I, Beijing, I, I right? So, it, so yeah. you don't have to invest regionally to bring down the infrastructure from wherever yeah. you are. But I would like to mention that, for example, the Chi Chinese companies were trying to develop nuclear generation in Romania. But very recently, I think the US administration, I mean, it's outgoing now, <laughs> but very recently, yeah, one would think, one would think, yeah. very recently, the Americans have just signed an, uh, an MOU with, uh, with the Romanians to develop two nuclear reactors in Romania and to expand the existing ones. Yeah. So I think the US is finally finally waking up to, to this point, which is absolutely valid, and I perfectly agree yeah. with Cyril. But I think that we are gradually seeing um, more interest in this region, and I do hope that it will expand, not just to Romania, but also to the entire, to the entire uh, uh, eastern flank of NATO. So... Uh, Thank, thanks very much. I, I really should step in here. Um, all of these <laughs> points are very valid. I really do appreciate them. But I would like to introduce uh, Griffin Cornwall, one of our program managers for energy security at the NATO Association. Griffin, I believe we have a, a few questions from the uh, from the floor from our audience. Please go ahead, and we'll try to deal with this in the next ten minutes. All right. Um, so I have a I have some questions from my colleagues uh, that I can combine into one question. Um, the first part was. Uh, given that Canada has witnessed tremendous domestic controversy over our over construction of our own domestic oil and gas pipelines, uh, which has substantial, substantially affected or often inhibited their construction, uh, are there equivalent controversies in Southeast Europe? And if so, do they, have they affected the industry? And kind of as a follow on to that, uh, what environmental concerns exist surrounding these, uh, the construction of these pipelines in Southeast Europe and how can they be best addressed? So I suppose, open question. I don't think we have too many environmental concerns, but Turk Stream is uh, on the sanctions list, um, like Nord Stream. So that could be a contra controversial point. And um, I, you know, the, the, it's, I'm, I'm talking about the Balkan extension of Turk Stream. So we're going to see what happens under the new administration and what position. And in fact, even before the, this year, whether the uh, the US administration will be um, proceeding with sanctions both against Nord Stream and Turk Stream. But in terms of environmental uh, issues. I suppose there were some environmental issues related to the LNG terminal that they are now looking to bring close to Istanbul in the Gulf of Saros. Um, but I don't think they, these were any, I, I don't think they are still uh, valid right now. I think we, we, we don't worry too much about the environment. Clearly we have a lot of coal in, <laughs> in Eastern Europe. And in Turkey, so uh, unfortunately, the environment sort of takes second position after politics. I don't know if Mariana wants to uh, step in on this. <laughs> no, no, just uh, just a very short comment because we have been uh, largely focusing on the midstream. We have been focusing on the on the infrastructure. Uh, but maybe uh, if I could draw your attention to the upstream here, because this is also a big part of the energy security debate, and this is where the uh, environmental concerns get in, but um, we have to look the broader picture for this. We said that we're on uh, the verge of being oversupplied in southeastern Europe. So we've got, we've got the midstream, we have created the transmission routes. Uh, the problem is, uh, what, are we, what are we going to fill the transmission routes with? 
And this is where I think that uh, broader policy and market factors come in. Like, uh, for instance, we've got, we witnessed uh, two price crashes within five years time. Uh, we, um, we, have, we have witnessed the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then there's the impact of the energy transition that has put pressure on uh, investors to sort of control emissions in their business operations. And that has, uh, along of course, with, the, with the, the changes in gas contracting, because we've got, we also have long-term contracts fading into history and long-term contracts have historically meant, have historically been translated into security for investors. So due to all these market and policy factors, including the environmental factor, we've seen um, uh, corporate and investor attitudes being impacted towards all things upstream, including gas. And I think it would be useful to think about this in order to see what future projects are going to supply our transmission routes in Southeastern Europe. Uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, fields from the Caspian and Central Asian region? What kind of LNG supplies? So if we think uh, in, the, in the current market and policy context, I think what's, uh, what's at risk is the, is, the, is the upstream rather than the midstream uh, in our region. All right, thank you. Uh... Dr. Savitas and uh, Mariana. Uh, I have one uh, last question for the, uh, for the panel. Um, I'll leave this one open as well. Um, but I was just curious to know how prepared are we to help countries uh, without gas industries grow into the market? Uh, Mariana, I believe it was you who mentioned that, you know, we are, we're looking at Montenegro, Albania, and Kosovo have no domestic gas industries to speak of. So how do we help uh, them or countries with gas industries, but that are more limited, grow into the, the general, general market? OK, uh, two things, and I will be really quick. Extension of the EU gas market rules, of the so-called uh, EU gas market acquis to the region. Uh, including uh, members and non-members alike, because, uh, for example, we, we have liberalization processes ongoing in markets like Bulgaria, which are already uh, member states, in markets like Greece, although Greece is, uh, relatively speaking, uh, in, a, in a good growth. Um, so extension of the EU gas market rules, diffusion of the EU gas market acquis to the countries, and uh, hardware infrastructure, because uh, gas market liberalization in the discussed region, apart from the software, also relies on the hardware. I don't want to, to summarize uh, infrastructure initiatives uh, once again, because I'm going to repeat myself. But these are the two things, software and hardware, either for existing markets or for countries where uh, no gas market exists whatsoever. Thank you. Robert, you are silent, which means that you are- Back to you, my passing friend. Passing it back to me. Uh, it's unclear whether there is time for one more question to wrap I think things if our up. Panelists, if our panelists can man manage it. Well, I, I do feel a moral obligation to make a public service announcement in the form of a question, uh, which is that um, in view of the fact that uh, the uh, US constitutional system does not elect a president by popular vote or by uh, media declarations, uh, and in view of the fact that the electors of the electoral college will not vote in their states until December 14th, until after the elections have been certified for you may know that there is some uh, that this is that this is a, a point that's that's being challenged in certain states and in view of the fact that the electoral that the votes of the electoral college are not counted until january 6th 
at which time they may be subject to challenge, something that escapes often attention. Uh, there, in view of the fact then that the US has no president elect until January 6th, I would invite you to intervene on this simple question of what difference it will make on January 20th for European gas markets, bearing in mind that the congressional legislation on sanctions against Russia does not permit the president to apply sanctions, but obliges him in the new version to apply sanctions. Bearing this in mind, uh, what will be the difference in so January 20th whether, between uh, a new Biden administration, or it's not to be excluded, a second Trump administration? Just a very simple question to conclude. Anyone can take that. Cyril. Yes. Um, this is, I think, a question that is hovering in oil and gas markets now since weeks. So what if and what will happen when if happens? Yeah. Um, I think for the region, um, if the current president is going to be uh, not anymore the president on the 20th of January 2021, I think um, politically certain parties in the region will have to readjust their behavior. And then I'm looking at populist parties in the Balkans, populist presidents in Central Europe, and uh, Sultan 2.0 in Ankara. Yeah. Um, um, at this moment, I think most of those populist groups have been having an easy way or a scapegoat under which they have been able to be doing what they were doing. Looking at the possibility, I'm not going to, uh, yeah, that if uh, that uh, the, maybe the president elect will become the president on the 20th, um, looking at what Democrats have been doing before, and Biden is, I think, Obama 2.0. Um, certain regional power projections will have a more harder time. The it's my friend in Turkey uh, position that Ankara has now with Washington, I think will be changed. Um, and for the energy sector, Trump has been at least officially more pro oil and gas and more pushing, but people were forgetting there would not have been any U.S. shale gas exports or U.S. shale oil exports without President Obama. Yeah, so Democrats are officially all anti-shale and anti-fracking, and I do not know what. But in reality, it's American politics. Even Fox becomes now more Democrat. So I believe that the Democrats will become more oil and gas focused because it's revenue and it helps the US budget not to blow up everything they can blow up. Um, for the region, they are in a flux. And then I'm not only talking about Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, but also the whole East Met and all of the in incumbent power projectors, UAE, Saudi, Qatar, in the region, they are on hold. Taking in mind, having some people in certain regions that are talking to me, it ain't over yet until the fat lady sings. And maybe the fat lady will sing uh, much harder two months to come than that we were 
Thank Correct. you, uh, Mariana, Ara. Any final remarks on this or any other matter? Yeah, uh, if if I may, uh, can I can I add something to what Cyril just said? Uh, basically, answering your question, Robert. Yes, we're winding up, and the focus is 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 this discussion. Yes. Okay. Um, so in terms of energy affairs in the region of Southeast Europe, I believe that whichever of the two uh, administrations wins, uh, it is going to hold the momentum of EU-US LNG trade within the framework of the EU-US Energy Council strong. And this alone is enough to, um, uh, to, to, to gasify or to create competition in gas markets in Southeastern Europe. However, uh, judging by its uh, um, ambitious uh, climate plan, what I think would be the main difference between a Biden and a Trump administration is that uh, LNG uh, shipped to Europe and to Southeast Europe included, uh, stands a better chance of being more uh, flexible and cleaner. And what I mean by that is that I see um, a Biden administration sort of more willing to exchange best practices in, uh, with Europe uh, in areas such as uh, methane leaks, uh, such as uh, green certification schemes, uh, and even in the longer term, uh, even hydrogen trading roles. So that would automatically uh, put the region of Southeast Europe more firmly into a gas decarbonization agenda. So that I think is the, will be the main difference. Thank you. Aura, anything else? Just very briefly, I think I would take a more pragmatic view and I would say that the re what happens in the region will not so much depend on whoever is in Washington. Of course it will matter, but happening, whatever happens in terms of demand in Asia, or in terms of demand in Europe related to coronavirus will impact more closely Eastern Europe. And again, we need to pay attention to local uh, events. For example, changes in legislation in Romania, because depending on what happens in terms of legal changes, we will know whether companies like ExxonMobil, which has been investing or looking to invest in the Black Sea, will decide to stay or not. So very much will depend on what happens in these countries. I mean, Romania will have elections next month, so that will dictate. Again, Ukraine, where will Ukraine go? We hear all sorts of stories about political interference. Well, it will depend very much whether the EUS will take a proactive role towards Ukraine, towards these all these other countries. Of course, it will depend. It will matter. But it will also matter what happens locally at local level and in these individual countries. Robert, your microphone is... Uh, yes, I just noticed. I said, marvelous. Um, uh, I know from experience that Robert Baines expects me to wrap up rather than to hand it back to him. So I will simply uh, thank uh, all of the panelists for their energetic, detailed, most knowledgeable and interactive uh, presentations and thanking uh, Griffin Cornwall for surveilling the uh, question and answer, Robert Baines for making this possible, and of course, the audience without whom we would not have a webinar. Uh, the Energy Security Program has monthly webinars. We've had September, October, November this year. We may skip January. We may have the end of January, but we'll have them in the new year on different topics. Uh, Eastern Europe, uh, you have some, some, some of the people who are here may well be back. Uh, we have not had a webinar yet on, I said Eastern Europe, I meant East Mediterranean. Uh, and we could have two uh, on that. We have not had one on North Africa, that's to be sure. And then there's always Ukraine, which we haven't dealt with directly either, except as uh, an addendum, as it were, to a Nord Stream 2. And if there's a new administration in Washington, or even if not, Nord Stream 2 is not going to go away. So please uh, stay uh, alert, uh, surveil your, your email boxes, sign up for uh, notifications, 
uh, there's more to come. Thanks so much, Robert. And also uh, feel free to subscribe to us on YouTube. It's a good way to, to make sure you'll uh, you'll see all of our, our next presentations. So thanks so much, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time.